there's just a couple of comments would be kind of introductory for those of you who most of you on the call have are familiar with it, but just a comment about this just council and what's what's going on here. Why do we do this? It's really just to promote just and to help ourselves express our thought leadership, you know, branding versus semantic arts for marketing purposes. But what we promise is that we will. So there's lots of changes that happened to just over the years. Um, and the speed of change has increased a bit. So we will keep, if you're using a particular version, we're not going to, it's not going to go away. It's always going to be there. You won't ever have to license it. Um, there's no lock in. You can do whatever you want. Upgrades are generally smooth and where there's um, changes to backwards compatibility, we make it very clear. We have version release notes, et cetera. And we're not going to be in your face saying you should use just, we're just going to offer it and say, here's something that you might find beneficial. Why would you be interested in just, um, you know, to make your project go a little bit faster, to avoid some rookie mistakes, um, and just kind of learn what other people are doing um, by attending and participating and listening in and contributing. And what we ask from you is that if you use GIST, you acknowledge it and you keep it in the semantic arts namespace and don't just make copies of GIST and put your own namespace on it. Um, and don't create concepts in the GIST namespace. That's called namespace squatting. Um, so that's that. All right, so now you can start recording. Um, okay. Okay, today is Thursday, June 2nd, and today we're gonna give a brief, well, actually a kind of somewhat thorough, and this may take two, possibly three sessions, a very broad overview of GIST for the past, year or two now, we've gone into a lot of details and a lot of individual concepts and concept areas and just, but we haven't really for quite a long time done just a broad overview. So for people who are already familiar with just, this will be a reminder of about things that maybe you haven't touched on. And also there's a number of things that have changed. So you may be used to one way of doing things, but the more recent versions have changed. Um, so that's really what we're gonna do today. So a broad overview, the design goals, why we created just in the first place, and really the most of this presentation is going to be look just walking through the different areas and different concepts that are used the most and talk about some common patterns. Um, so what is GIST? It's an upper enterprise ontology which has kind of a minimal set of concepts that most businesses will need. So anyone using GIST will probably use 50 to 70 percent of the concepts there um, and some will not apply but anything in GIST is meant to be useful for a broad range of enterprises. Okay, if you use just please use this particular attribution. Um, and so this talk, this which again say may stretch two or possibly three sessions, but let's go with two for the moment. Uh, what do I want? What am I hoping for you who are listening in? I would like it for everyone to walk away saying to themselves, hey, I understand now the background purpose and use of GIST, and I could explain it to my colleagues to some reasonable um, degree of accuracy, um, that you would be familiar with the overall structure. What are the main classes and the main kind of areas, the main properties and how those classes and properties interact? Um, and also, once you studied a bit more, you would, you know, be able to have enough working knowledge of GIST to be able to, you know, map existing ontologies to GIST, or at least you know how to look and study GIST so that you can familiarize yourself and be able to do such mapping. Because that's ultimately that's what it's about. You go, you're in a new industry. I mean, so you're in your own industry, whether it's healthcare or finance or commodities market pricing. And you have your own concepts in your enterprise, and you want to make use of GIST. So you need to know where to put your concepts, um, where in GIST that they go. And they'll spend a lot of time talking about those types of things. Um, and again, to be able to have just enough knowledge to feel comfortable jumping in um, and looking in more details of GIST. So why do we create just in the first place? Well, there's two real purposes where it just helps out. One is if you're an ontologist building ontologies, you can use it as a starting place. You don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. So that means you can go faster um, because just has a fair amount of axioms to to give, you know, reduce significantly the ambiguity of a particular concept. Um, it's easier to understand and have people make fewer mistakes. Um, and again, it's it's just an relatively elegant. We strive for elegance that we, we figure just is kind of done 
more because we there's we can't take anything more out instead of there's nothing more to add. Um, so less complexity just means it's easier to understand. But also for people who are using the ontology, even if you're not a developer, if you're using the ontology, the fact that the same ontology is used for multiple applications means that there's a, already a shared um, uh, set of concepts. And so if you need to integrate or interoperate, you have a whole lot less mapping to do. So that's two main broad categories of how just can be helpful in your organization. Um, so broad design goals. What we want to be true is that with very few exceptions, every concept in your domain ontology, whether it's um, again, healthcare, a patient visit, or whether it's a specif specification of a product um, or anything like that, you can look at your concept and say, aha, this is what I have in my hand. This is important for my business. Where do I find, where does it go? And just right. So the idea is there's adequate coverage. So there's a just concept somewhere there for you that you can map into. Um, and there's not there's not more than one choice. In other words, you don't want to have five different choices, and each one is like, well, is it this one or is it that one? Oh, maybe it's this third one. And this is one of the big advantages of just being, if we like, elegant, having relatively small, because there are there are uh, there are ontologies out there with thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of classes, and any human being can't possibly, if you give 10 human beings the task of taking a given set of 10 things and saying, okay, take these 10 things and find out where they go in a list of 300,000 categories, the chances of everybody getting <clears throat> the exact same categorizations is almost zero. So the idea is let's have a relatively small number of things and have it be clear where things go. Uh, but it's one thing to say there is a place for it to go. The next thing is to be able to find it. Um, so in other words, we've structured just in such a way it has a relatively small number of upper level concepts. Um, and each concept is defined and so that you can understand it and kind of scan around and get a rough idea. OK, it's probably goes under here, roughly speaking. Let me poke around and see what I can find. So the idea is. We want things to be able to find, we want something to be there for you to map to, but also to make it you know, relatively findable. Um, so how does GIST actually help with the question of ambiguity? Well, for one, much thinking has already been done for you. Um, so you look to see if the concept you need is already somewhere in GIST. Um, and you might see two different things and say, oh, actually those are kind of similar. Um, so what's the difference? Um, and so you, we would force you to make the choice between which one it really is. So this increases the likelihood of that you're modeling the things the way they are in fact in the world, um, and you don't have to spend as much time reinventing the wheel. How does just help with complexity? Well, a simple and elegant, relatively small number of things. There's about 100 odd classes and 100 odd properties if, at last count, if I'm correct. If there's someone out there and they have a different number, then let me know. Actually, we can just double check. How about this? You can go to just, I've got just loaded here in case we want to have a look. Um, class count, 139. Object property count, 92. Data property count. So they got about 130 odd classes and about 130 um, properties. So roughly 130, 140 classes and same number of properties. Okay, there you go. Um, and also, what you often see is distinctions that don't make a difference. In other words, we came across uh, a company one time where they had different kinds of five different ways of looking at what if we looked underneath. The covers and really poked at it for a while. You realize this is really the same thing. You know, at the end of the day, it's the same thing, just being looked at and used by different people from different perspectives. Um, and so you can remove all these unnecessary distinctions. And say, ah, this this is all really the same thing. So what happens if you don't use just? Well, there's this famous example of the Mars Explorer. You took off, went into orbit, did all its thing, arrived some months later on the planet Mars, and then it crashed. On the surface. Why did it crash? It crashed because there was an error. Somebody didn't get the units conversions. And just we have units conversions. So if they'd have used just properly, it wouldn't have ever happened. So that's our little marketing spiel. Um, 
Okay. So here's a list of the main areas of GIST, and we're just going to speak to each one a little bit now, and then go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So fundamental to any organization is the idea of an organization in the first place. You have organizations and divisions and subdivisions and whatnot, and even government organizations count as organizations. And of course, there's people who do things. Um, most well these days there's a lot of organizations like google and facebook that don't produce physical things but a lot of companies still do they make cars they um you know sell phones etc so there's a whole class of physical things that are quite often important in most businesses even if it's just your computers and and you know the desktops and your furniture those are physical things that you may be tracking in your organization and, and then there are substances we'll get into that distinction a bit later Wide variety of places, um, geographical regions, addresses, buildings, etc. Well, actually, addresses, we're going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. An address really isn't a place, it's a pointer to how to get to a place. Um, <clears throat> there's also identifiers, which are a really important thing in a business. How do you unambiguously know what something is referred to? Employee, employment identifiers, serial numbers, all kinds of things. <clears throat> Events is a really important thing in any organization. You create things, you do things, you manufacture things, you assess things, you create agreements. All these things happen at a particular point in time or over a period of time. And we have some <clears throat> time related concepts. Um, we had a major change in just between the last versions. <laughs> For the longest time, we had a class called Time Instant, and we had various properties that pointed to Time Instant, and we've removed that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So instead, we have properties that talk about start times and end times and with different precisions. It started this week, this month, this year, this millisecond. Intellectual property, we don't have a lot to say about that. It's, it's an important thing, um, and sometimes it shows up in a, pro, in a client ontology. Brands is, is a particularly important piece of intellectual property. Um, categories and collections, a really, really big deal. Um, and we'll get into that a fair amount. You group things together in different ways. There's three different ways you can group things together uh, from a technological perspective, and we'll get into that. So you can use all classes, you can use just categories, or you can use just collections. Um, and then there's a whole bucket of things. This is kind of a generic abstract class called intention, and it's all about what should or shouldn't be. You know, my, my intention is that this should always or should never or sometimes under these conditions be this way or that way. And examples of that include you know, commitments. So a commitment uh, or an offer. I will, I, intend, um, I, I commit to giving you this car if you give me $37,000. And that's an offer you put up an ad in a newspaper. And that's, um, that's a commitment of a sort. It's kind of a, a unilateral commitment from one person to the broader public. What is it that's being offered? Well, we have a class called catalog item, something that you could point to in a catalog and say, I want one of those. Um, various kinds of things, products and services can, all, either of those can be catalog items. Templates, kind of structures from which you build things modeled after that particular format. Um, and then we have a class called content and it, and, and it relates to this idea of media. So you have content, maybe a paper you wrote. Um, it could be a PDF file, it could be Word, it could be any number of things. Or it could be printed out on paper or you know on a CD. There's all kinds of different things you can say about content. Um, another thing that shows up quite a lot in our different organizations, our different um, engagements with different companies is quantities, units, and measures. We'll talk about how we do that. Um, and finally, there's a little bit of a dumpster bucket for things that don't seem to fit anywhere else, and they're all about, it's kind of, it's very much a meta level thing, you know, schema and classes, you know, things that talk about the process of modeling, the process of doing things in computational manner. So this is kind of a broad walk through the whole range of things that are in um, GIST. So let's now look at an example. So we created a ontology for healthcare. Um, so things in healthcare, that particular subject matter, disease, a person. Now in blue here is something that a very, well, no, it's not rare that it, there will be things that you directly create instances of in a company. So person exists in 
just somewhere, it's underneath a physical identifiable item. There are patients which are people, medical professionals, which are also people, therapies, hospitals, drug sites. And the idea is you can look at any one of these things and point to something over here and say it's one of those. And that's something that takes time and experience. So let's now dig into a little bit of detail on each of, each of these areas. And again, please interrupt frequently uh, whenever you feel like you need a clarification or you'd like to ask a question that you think others would also benefit from, or even just yourself. You know, jump in. Um, I don't have an agenda about getting through a certain amount of material. This is just going to be open to everyone <clears throat> to go at the right pace. OK, so in a company, there's lots of things that involve people or organization divisions, etc. Sometimes it, you know it's a person or an organization, but you don't know which beforehand. So it's, um, for example, a party to an agreement or a contract or a sale. The party itself could be another organization or it could be a person. So it could be person to person, person to organization, or organization to organization. Um, or obligations, I'm obliged to do something and you're the recipient of my obligation to you and you're the receiver on that obligation. Um, people can allocate identifiers or organizations or even computer programs can identify, can allocate identifiers. Um, messages can be sent and received uh, persons and organizations. This sometimes um, our client um, engagements will involve this notion of a legal entity. We did work with um, some legal organizations in the past. And notion of ownership, governing, being recognized, these are things that impact in the legal realm. Persons and organizations also have addresses, um, ways of being reached for communication purposes. Um, so here's just, because this is so pervasive, it touches on many, many different things in um, GIST. So here's just a screenshot, but I can go ahead and go to find GIST person and just kind of show you this. I'll just search for a person. There it is. And there's something really nice in, um, if you want to get a sense of exploring GIST, in protege, you go to any particular class or property and the annotations say something about it. So there's not a lot that we say about a person. It's a human being that may or may not still be alive. And we say, no, we don't mean fictional characters like Mickey Mouse. The question then becomes, well, what is Mickey Mouse? Well, it turns out Mickey Mouse is intellectual property, but we'll, we'll come, come back to that later. But you can also, in addition to reading the annotations that help you understand uh, a given concept, class, or property, or individual, you can click this usage button. Question, comment? No? OK. Um, so where does person show up in GIST? Well, it shows up in agreements. Um, shows up in categories because you and eight things that come from agents or move to agents, commitments, contingent obligations, control vocabularies. So there's a whole lot of things. But if you just click on obligation and look at how much obligation is, obligation shows up just in one just in one place, agreement. So this is a nice thing that you can use to explore um, different well, concepts. I had a quick and question things. in the uh, chat. Could I read it to you? Absolutely. Uh, Casey said, given that we often care about the disjunction of person and organization, why not add in agent as a superclass <laughs> of both person and organization? This is what I ended up doing, and I'm curious what reasons might be for not doing that. You know that we've had a lot of discussion about that, and it's a matter of personal taste. Um, so the argument for doing what you're saying is you can create a class called something like party just used to have such a thing. It was called social being. Um, but a, and a FIBO, the financial industry business ontology also has such a concept It's called party. Um, the reason we didn't is. Um, if you do that, then you have a top level thing. It, we didn't want it's kind of an abstraction and we're trying to avoid abstractions. Um, but if you what I kind of like having it because it's convenient. So what I will often do in my ontologies that I'm building for clients is I'll create a class called party. I'll make it exactly equal to the union of person and organization, and I will use it in the way you said. So 
It's just a judgment call, um, a matter of preference, and we had a discussion about it and went one way instead of the other, but that's a good question. So uh, this is Jim. Uh, Go ahead. Or how about <laughs> roles, like a, a role an individual might play? How, do, how does that, how's that described or how do you handle that? We will have a discussion about that later on, so hold on to it. <laughs> OK, and it might not be today because there's a lot of material to go through, but that's a that's terrific right. question. It's a very, very important one. And we have several slides devoted exactly to that. OK, now let's look at organizations. Here's now the, the actual details of annotations um, are changing over time and we're, we're doing semi systematic culling of the bad definitions. And replacing them with good ones. So there's, and I didn't do a nitpicky check for every single definition to make sure it was up to date with, that, with the very last version. Things are changing somewhat rapidly, and it's hard to keep everything up and running. Um, but let's just say an organization. Well, in fact, we can look at the latest one here. Organization. What is organization? A generic organization that can be formal or informal, legal or non-legal, it can have members or not. So this is this is one of those definitions that it's it's okay for the human to look at and kind of get a general idea. We're trying to be a little bit cleaner and tighter about our definitions and have a more consistent um, formatting. <clears throat> but that's you can get a pretty good idea of what it means from that text. Um, examples: corporations, non-government organizations, clubs, committees, departments, any almost anything which is comes together, it has people or organizations as part of it, um, and it has some kind of purpose, some reason for being a unit. Government organizations uh, are a really common example. I think we have a class called government organizations for that purpose. Um, and then governments, a country government is a special kind of government organization that governs a geo region. So the United States government governs the area which is you know, under our arena, including, you know, the lower 48, Alaska, Hawaii, and we have various other administrative <clears throat> regions like Puerto Rico and Guam and things like that. So you define the organizations that you need. So we give you one, well, just a small number of classes um, for organizations. Let's go see what organizations, sub organizations. Yeah, we don't have a whole lot of detail under that. We've got a little bit more. So the organization have government organizations and with their special cases of a country government and then the sub country, for example, state government or county government or something like that, that would be um, possible. And then we have intergovernmental organizations, things like IMF or the UN, and they're also treaty organizations. So we recently, we had used to have just a much leaner set of organizations. We've recently expanded that. Uh, to add a couple of extra things. Back to the slideshow. Um, so again, this is a little bit out of date. Actually, it's pretty close, but anyways, as I said, I haven't walked through and made every single change in this deck. However, here's an example that's interesting from the perspective of, hey, I'm going to be using GIST for my organization. So we did work with the International Monetary Fund, and here's here are the organizations that came up came out that they wanted to define for their own internal use. So there's a notion of an IMF organization, which is uh, could be IMF itself or any of its subdivisions or sub organizations. And then there's anything else that's not an IMF organization. It's very often important. Many organ we've had used this pattern many times where we define the notion of an external organization and an internal one. And that's perspective dependent. So for example, if you're Apple, then Google is an external organization. But if you're Google, Google is not an external organization. So you have to be careful about these things that are kind of relative to a perspective. But inside your organization, you know, you can you can do that and it's not going to cause an ambiguity problem. So what kind of organizations exist that are important and people think about a lot and work and manage inside IMF? Well, there's something called a country team. So one of IMF's main goals in life is to go out there into the world and help countries, you know, develop and get off their, get, get, improve their economic and social situation. So they have teams put together to help out, you know, a given country, Angola or, or um, Uganda or, or, or anywhere else. Um, and then in any case, they have something called department, they have something called division, and these are very 
informal loosey-goosey terms and every company will use them differently and some companies are very careful in how they use department and it only means one kind of thing other companies the word department will be used all over the place and it will have different meanings um, so again this is just some of the th questions that you have to think about when you're building an ontology for your particular organization and here's something else that often arises the notion of a staff member or an employee any given company. So there's a notion of employee, broadly speaking, but then there's an employee of that particular company. And these are the organizations that were deemed to be useful for the context of the particular knowledge graph we we're building for this um, client. OK, next topic, physicality, stuff that takes up space and has mass, right? Um, so those divide broadly up into two sub areas, physical identifiable item, which is a bit of an awkward name, but it, it's it's there and we're sticking with it for the time being until someone can think of a better name. Something that you can count. You can have 10 of them, right? Um, a person, a landmark, a building, a piece of equipment, um, things like that. And then there's, you know, water, you know, a water that's in a bowl or sand. Um, and what's the main difference is, and we recently tidied up the definitions for these things. Water, any any physical substance um, in gist is something that if you divide it up into, no matter how you divide it up into parts, the different parts are always the exact same kind of thing. So if you take a bowl of water and you dip into it and you have all the different kinds of water or sand, it's still water, it's still sand. No matter how many ways you divide it up or subdivide it into pieces, it's always still the exact same stuff. Whereas a physical identifiable item like equipment or your car or your computer, you can be sure that if you take any piece off of a laptop computer, that piece is not gonna, you know, all the different pieces aren't gonna still be in each laptop computers. Take a wheel off your car, it's not a car anymore. So that's an important distinction. Persons also fall under this category because they are, physical beings um, and let me just for just for fun i'll show you <coughs> michael definition. yeah so I assume, yeah i assume that some quantity of sand right the 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 pile of sand that's on the scale right now would probably be both you know this other thing which is sand as well as something that's physical and takes up space like how do you handle that when you've got some amount of one of these things well, that's I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly and uh, fully understand your question, but let me speak to it a little bit. And if I didn't catch it, then let me know. Sure. I want, and thank you for asking it, because that is something I forgot to emphasize. Um, the word substance is used um, in two ways, and we, we've chosen one of those ways. People often talk about, you know, a, a type of substance, for example, insulin. Um, and you could have a taxonomy of types of substances, one of which would be insulin, one of which would be plastic, and that would be a taxonomy. But that's different. But the type of thing which this chemist speaks to and has a molecular structure, that itself is a category, if you like. It's not, it, it's not, does it doesn't have space. So the kind of thing it is versus some amount of that thing is an important distinction. And in just for better or for worse, physical substance corresponds to the actual stuff okay and if you want and we'll, we'll have a slide that speaks to this a little bit later on okay. um so, so if you have a particular amount of water that's in your cup then you could say that amount of water is an instance of just physical substance and you yep. can say well, that's fine but what kind of a thing is it and then you'd say oh it's categorized by some product or substance hierarchy different kinds of things so we work with a company that does pricing for commodities, aluminum and oil and agricultural products, et cetera. Um, so they have a taxonomy of different kinds of oil and gas and metals and all this kind of stuff. And that taxonomy is types of things. And the actual, if they're tracking a shipment of 5,000 or 5 million gallons of crude, you know, going from Russia to, you know, the Congo, you know that now that would be that would become an instance of the physical substance and it would point to something that's in the product taxonomy perfect that makes, that that makes total sense that's exactly yeah. it thanks okay perfect thank you again thank you again for asking that question because I, I glossed over something that that's quite important and you caught me so thank you okay still on a notion of physical things um building is something that we put in just 
Um, it's also a place. We have places kind of a, a, a uber generic concept of which there are many different things. And a building is not itself an address, but it will typically have an address. But not all buildings have addresses. If you have an if you have a if you live out in a suburb somewhere and you have a have a shed in the backyard, maybe it's even a second building. It doesn't have an address. Your house has an address, but the post office is never going to deliver anything to your shed or even your outbuilding that you might be renting out to somebody. I suppose in that case you might want to give it an address. At any rate, so let's talk a little bit about um, but we're going to talk more about buildings later uh, and addresses later. So what's a person? A person is a human being that may or may not still be alive. So we take the position that it's, you know, it's flesh and blood, or at least it was. So Einstein died a long time ago. He doesn't have flesh and blood anymore. So this is, you could argue this is a slight inconsistency with just, and there are things that are ontologically, you know, questionable for, if you're a philosopher and an academic which don't seem to matter in practice when we do client works. And this is one example of that. We absolutely rule out fictional characters like Mickey Mouse. Um, and also we note the fact that a person has a biological parent that is also a person. So you can't be a person whose biological parent is, is not a person. That's just not how it works. Um, now, the question came up a few minutes ago about roles. So people participate in things in certain ways. So let's just take three examples. <clears throat> a patient visit, you go to the hospital, you get your appendix removed. <clears throat> what, who's, what's going on here and who's playing what role? So there's two main roles. There's the care provider, the doctor who's doing the surgery, and there's you who's in there getting your appendix removed. So the way we recommend um, representing roles, 9% of the time, this is a good way to do it. Um, you have an event or an agreement or something like that. For example, the event of a patient visit is you went to the doctor and you had your appendix removed. So when you have events like that, there's usually different participants in that event, and each participant is playing a role. And we model that role-ness, if you like, with a, with an object property. Okay, so let's look at two more examples. Um, these are real examples that all come from client um, work. So a loan contract. What are the main, there's a variety of different roles. Here's three key, the main, the two main ones is there's a borrower and there's a lender. So you create an instance of loan contract and you say, well, I need to point to the lender and I need to point to the borrower. Now, this is one of the examples where if you wanted to create something called party, you could just say the domain and the range of loan contract is party because it can't be a car that's borrowing money and it can't be a pile of sand that's borrowing money. <clears throat> it has to be an organization or a person. But a loan contract, there's lots of other things that are true about loan contracts. Here's just one more. It's usually an originator of that loan contract. So here's three different roles, each one represented as a property, as an object property. There's another thing related to a mortgage. So a loan contract, which is a mortgage, will often have a corresponding property appraisal. Not always. You, I could just sell my house to the neighbor because he's my best friend, and we just say, yeah, just give me $500,000 and we'll call it good. No property appraisal, no nothing. So there isn't always uh, all a person or organization filling all these roles, but these are things that sometimes happen on some instances of these things. So what's the property appraisal have? Well, there's the property itself that's being appraised, and there's the appraiser who's doing the appraising, and sometimes you have a senior appraiser that maybe looks over your results and says, okay, that's fine, except for these three things you need to go fix. Um, so the those are three examples, and again, just to repeat, we have a generic prop, the, representing roles as all properties works most of the time. Um, and because there's, it's a very different specific kind of thing, we decided to create an abstract property called has participant, of which all these role properties would be sub properties. Um, very occasionally, um, and we don't see it very often, but there can be a need to model the role as a class itself where you instantiate it. Um, so, for example, Michael Ushel being a borrower on one loan versus Michael Ushel being a borrower on another loan, um, you might say, well, I need to say something different about Michael Ushel in the context of that one loan versus Michael Ushel in the context of the other loan. And so I'm not really saying that about Michael Ushel per se. So that would be a case where 
you'd have to create an instance of that means Michael Ushold as the bower on this loan, and another instance of a, a role being in a kind of like I would think of that as a filled role. So you could have a class called something like filled role. You would say Michael Ushold, an instance of filled role. One instance would be Michael Ushold as the bower on loan one. Another instance of filled role would be Michael Ushold as a bower on loan two. Okay. So that would be something that would arise from time to time, but we really see that very rarely. Um, so that's just an answer to the question that came up earlier about roles. So let's look at has participant. It's, it's kind of a, it bundles up all the different kinds of role properties. And we have a few generic ones in GIST as well. So let's just have a quick look. So has participant, it relates something, for example, an agreement to something that plays a role or takes part or is otherwise involved in some way in that thing. Okay, so as I said, quite often it's agreements and events. This is most of the time it's an agreement or event that has a participant. Um, the event of transferring money has a participating account that receives the money. That's one example. Um, and then we also have scope notes, which is kind of a, a lot of slight elaborations, give a little bit more information, but it's not a definition per se. Um, and this is what I've said a few times, uh, things that have participants, most of the time they're going to be either events, have agreements or obligations, and very occasionally something else arises, but almost always it's one of these two things that has a participant. Um, and again, this is important, it's intended to be an abstract property. So when you look at the hierarchy of properties, you don't have all the different role properties scattered about, they're all in one place. That's just more a matter of convenience than necessity. Now we have some example generic role properties in GIST already. So um, if you have a, a sending event, where, a transport event where some oil is shipped from, you know, London to New York, say, um, it it has different roles. What is being shipped? Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? Etc. Um, for sale events, I purchased my car from the local Subaru dealer. So there's a purchase agreement and there's someone or there's an obligation to for me to pay for that car and there's an obligation for the dealer to deliver that car to me. So on the deliver obligation, the giver is the dealer and the recipient is Michael. On the payment obligation, the giver is Michael and the recipient is the dealer. Now, in fact, there's more complications about it because I might not be giving money directly to the dealer. I might be giving it to some third party, but let's ignore those distinctions. So this is um, participation and how we model roles. So that kind of completes our persons and organizations section. Let me pause there for a minute. And again, I can see this is probably going to last three sessions, but that's just fine. Um, I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop there for a minute and see if there's any questions or comments from anyone. No, wow, OK, that's great. So let's move on to places. Um, so we have a variety of places in GIST, and we'll just walk through some of these. The most common one is geo region. So the region could have natural boundaries, you know, um, coastlines and rivers and things like that. Or it could be political boundaries, which most often shows up in our client engagements. Um, we also have this notion of a country government um, which controls a geo region which used to be called country i need to update this slide we currently have um, geo regions that break down into governed geo regions and if you're a governed geo region you could be a country geo region okay um and there's also things like routes you know a collection of points from a to b to c to d to e and there's a segment which is one connection between two different points along a route. And then there's a volume. We haven't, some of these we haven't seen much usage. They're there because they we thought they'd be useful at one point in time. And sometimes when things are sitting around for a long time, we don't use them, we just take them out. Uh -huh. Now it's interesting, we schema.org has something called administrative area for regions with political boundaries, such as country, county, city. And we have, um, Actually, who's on our call? What do we call that now? Does anyone 
and just remember what we call that. Oh, it's a governed georegion, that's what it is. So governed georegion is one that has political boundaries um, and it's pretty much the exact same meaning as what you will see called administrative area in schema.org. Now here's something that's a little bit surprising at first glance, a time zone. What is a time zone? Well, Actually, we always think of it as what time is it, you know, how many hours is it offset from one place to another, but the time zone itself really is a region. It's an area um, that happened, that has a time, but really corresponds to a region. Um, now, building, of course, is a landmark. Um, we have a, another abstract class. You often, you might or might not create individual instances of landmark. You would typically say what kind of landmark it is. And we only have one in just um, so we have things that show up under place, but something but a building, whereas it's a place, it's also a physical identifiable item. So things will show up in multiple places in, in certain occasions on just. So that's places. I have that's a question. A, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> Sorry. please. Yeah. Uh, so do you have a way, um, two questions actually, um, do you have a way to enumerate um, codes? for uh, countries or time zone like ISO codes and so on. And the second question is, do you have a way to say that a, uh, a region uh, has a specific coordinates? Yes, so, that's true. Yep. Uh, we, we don't, we so far, well, yes, that's true. Do you have a specific question you want me to answer? Just if you want me to comment on that. Yeah, uh, if you if you can uh, comment and, and say how you do it a little bit, if um, if you're uh, okay, if you're a few minutes sure. or for a few seconds. Uh, okay, but is it the we, there are lots of GIS systems out there, and so far we haven't had a client that needed to do that kind of um, computation. Um, and there's also something called GeoSparkle about which I know just a little bit. It's very specifically designed to do that kind of thing. So you have latitude, longitude, poly polygons and all this kind of stuff. So there are people out there who have particular need to do that and you can do that just uh, because it hasn't doesn't show up most in a substantial portion of enterprise um, applications. We have not included it in just. Um, OK, OK, I understand. But that's that's normal. I mean, the whole point of GIST is to say, hey, for a given anybody, anybody creating an, you know, it's just meant to include things that are broadly usable across most enterprises, or at least a substantial portion of them. And most enterprises that we've worked with haven't had the need to do specific georegion calculation. And even the ones that you would think really care about it, um, you know, like geological explanation, they somehow the, the when we're building knowledge graphs for them, that hasn't entered into it. They already have their GIS systems that already works just fine. We haven't in practice yet seen a case where they wanted to integrate that geographic stuff into the knowledge graph itself. Okay, understand. Yeah, that's great. But in, in for the codes, how, how do you do it? Do you enumerate the codes and do you have maybe a relationship like as a high school code or whatever? Or, or you, oh, you don't mean for that? That's a great question. Uh, so you mean like the ISO code for the United States or maybe the, well, yeah, we've done that many times. So we'll come later on, we'll talk about identifiers, but let's say the country um, Germany, or the country United States or the country Chile, right? They have ISO codes, but there's two kinds of ISO codes. There's probably 10 for all I know, but two main ones are the three letter code and the two letter code. And so we have uh, multiple occasions modeled that we have an instance, we have a class called ID and we create a subclass of that class ID and we say this is the three letter ISO code. And then each country has uh, has a code that's associated with it. So that's a that's one of the patterns we have. OK, Peter's got his hand up. Go ahead. Hi, just to say that. Um, a lot more triple stores these days have got GeoSparkle capability and uh, I've been doing work with both Fuseki GeoSparkle and also <laughs> with uh, GraphDB. And um, uh, so they offer two sorts of things. W one of them is the topological logic to do with whether or not things are uh, 
you know, one thing within another, whether they intersect, whether they are tangential and so on. And you can use that for all manner of different things, including, well, you can probably use it in a kind of abstract way with regard to describing things like policy and things like that. Um, but you can use it for any particular spatial thing. So you can use it for components on a printed circuit board just as much as you can use it for geography. And then the other thing is that they have a whole bunch of uh, functions for uh, geospatial calculations. And the expectation of the data is either in well-known text, WKT, or geographical markup language, GML, uh, uh, RDF. And if you want to talk about it, happy to have a bilateral with you. Peter, one quick uh, question um, from you right now. Do you have experience with something, an actual project, a client project with semantic mm -hmm. arts where they did use GeoSparkle for something? And can you say what that was, if there was? Yeah. the the. I'm I'm currently working with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and they have a lot of research uh -huh. programs that involve things like where particular samples were taken in the seas, and so on. And these okay. are all, uh, you, you know, sort of polylines or multi lines of right. WTS eighty four coordinates, and. Right. Uh, Thank you. That then enables you to have an interface where you kind of drag out a polygon uh, and then to take a look at uh, what's what's there. But you could use exactly the same for things like an estate agency or something like that. You know, anybody that's got dots on the earth. So th there are those two yeah. things. One of, them is this, one of them is the topological logic, you know, as to whether or not things overlap, whether they intersect, whether they're tangential, whether they're completely separated, all that sort of stuff, which is, uh, it can be used for real things, but also I suspect can be used for fairly abstract things. Right. And then there's things where what you're wanting to do is to actually use real identifiers um, to do some computations. What's the distance? I've been doing things with the pharmaceutical company where what we did was mm -hmm. to take a look at the A to B distance of shipping, where we were using mm -hmm. the geospatial functions uh, and then to bring that into a visualization showing the distances. And that's particularly helpful when we're looking at things like reducing carbon footprints because what we can do is work out what the most efficient routes are in that sort of way. Thank you. In fact, uh, while you're speaking, it just occurred to me that one of our current projects with a networking company, people who lay lines and when you start a new business and you want an internet connection, you call them up and say, hey, I need so many gigs with uptime requirements and then they provide a, a link for you, but that link has to come from some uh, somewhere else. And um, the distances are important. So there's a, a Los Angeles hub and there's a Denver hub. Yeah. Um, and if you're living in if you're living in Wyoming, you should probably use the Denver hub. So there's a little bit of a need that we we may end up in that project in the next two years. I think years the point that I'm making is that is that this functionality exists and whereas at one time it used to be very limited and uh, not very performant these yep. sorts of restrictions are disappearing like snow off a dike. So I think we <laughs> should be tooling up to begin to start yeah. using them as a matter of course. All right, we got five minutes left. I'm gonna see if there's something that I can get into briefly and then we can kind of review it next time. So let's just take a couple minutes and events and then I'll stop at the top of the hour and then we can continue from here. So events are massively important in any organization you track things that happen. So there's things, there's two things that might be happening at the same time. There's historical events, things that happened in the past that you track them. And there's physical events which happened at a place, but this this meeting we're having right now, it, it hardly has, a, it doesn't have a physical place. You can talk about a notion of a cyber place and maybe the Teams link that you all use to join is, could be construed as where this is happening, but it's not a it's not a physical place, but some events are physical, like you go to a conference in New York City, that's a physical place, or you manufactured a widget 
um, that's a physical event. There are events that you plan ahead for, but they haven't happened yet, but they're planned. And there's an interesting case of planned events um, or contingent events. In other words, when you have a insurance policy, you know, there's a contingent event of you had an accident. Well, that might happen, and I will pay you money if, if that event happens. So contingent on this event happening, um, I will you know, re re reimburse you and so on. And then there's tasks. Tasks we model. This is a bit controversial. We're wondering if we should change the names. But in this case, we're modeling task as the event of performing a task. So we're thinking we might rename that to be something like task execution. But at the moment, a task is something that is, is being done. And an, sub, an example of a task is one that has subtasks. And if it has subtasks, then we say, oh, let's call it a project. Um, and then some tasks are scheduled, some are not, and then there are transactions. So this is what I've just spoken to. And at that, I'm going to stop. OK, so final comments or questions, and then we'll continue from here. I'll, I'll review. I'll do a quick overview next time, and then we'll continue with events. And you see we're on slide 29 and there's 91 slides. So let's make a for two more sessions. This is great. Yeah, I for me, um, I, I will say it's kind of interesting because I always think of a project as a higher level and then the tasks as being at a sub, you know, a, a level yes. of the project. Um, and maybe I'm just not quite understanding um i'm glad you asked that because it is confusing yes in terms of size project is bigger than a task but if you think of the question what is a task a task is the event of doing something some doing some things are easy like i just ticked off that box that said mike on thursday morning you have to give the just council meeting so that's a task i did it it's done i tick the box off um it's really just one thing but some tasks are bigger than other tasks, and they involve multiple events, multiple plannings, multiple subjects, and those kinds of events are big enough that we call them a project. So some tasks are small and simple, some are bigger and have lots of subtasks, and that subset of all tasks that have lots of subtasks going on, mm. we call those projects. Sort of a collection we of tasks. tasks of templates? Yeah, I don't I don't have that here. Uh, uh, that might I think I have templates somewhere else, but you're right, Peter. That's a good one to add here. Let me make a note to myself. Yeah, I mean, the, the point about it is that when we deal with provenance, you want to have an idea of what it is that you're actually proposing to do, which can be described as a task template. And then what you can do is describe what you actually did as tasks. And that's kind of very helpful. Yes, then what you can do is describe the forward view of your proposed piece of work. And then you can look in the rear view mirror and, and log what you actually did. Right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, with that, I'm going to close. Um, it's right at the top of the hour. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you. See you all. Thanks. Thank that you. Was really interesting, Michael. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome.